So I want to graph y equal to sine of x. We're going to do this one kind of the long way, and then we'll talk about kind of the shorter way to do it for cosine. I'm going to make a whole table of x and y values. Of x values and y values, or y is sine of whatever x is. And the x values I'm going to pick are going to be the usual nice angle values in radians. So I'm going to start with zero radians, and sine of zero radians is zero. I often use my unit circle when I'm thinking about this. So if I'm, I'm going to erase this in a minute. So I'm thinking about my unit circle, right? I know that this is the point one zero. This is the point zero one. Negative one zero. Zero negative one. And this is the angle zero radians, pi over two radians, pi radians, three pi over two radians, and three pi radians. Now what I always remember is that when we start at zero and go up to pi over two, the sine values get bigger. And sine of zero is zero, and then the next angle, pi over six, sine of pi over six is one half. And then the next base angle is pi over four, right? So there's pi over six, there's pi over four, there's pi over three. Sine of pi over four is root two over two. Uh, pi over three, sine of pi over three is root three over two. And pi over two, sine of pi over two is one. So we're going to use these values to help us start graphing y as a function of x. So I'm going to erase this. We're going to do one full revolution or one full period of the sine function. And we're going to cut that up into the four quadrants. I'm going to, I'm going to dot lead the circle down here again. Right. So here's what I'm kind of thinking when I do this. I know that I'm going to start with sine of zero being zero, and then in quadrant one, sine's going to go from zero to one. So I'm going to draw my four quadrants or the ends of my four quadrants here, right? Zero, pi over two, pi, three pi over two, two pi. And that's pretty typical. We usually break up our period into the four quadrants. And then sine of zero is zero. And now I will say, I don't typically plot all these points. We can. I can say that sine of pi over six, which is about there, is one half. And sine of pi over four, which is about there, is root two over two, which is about 0.7. And sine of pi over three, which is about right here, is root three over two, which is about 0.86. And then sine of pi over two is one. So the first quarter of this graph looks like this. But in reality, what I really do is I just plot this point and this point. And while I could graph all the points in quadrant two, like where the angle is, 2 pi over 3, and 3 pi over 4, and 5 pi over 6, and then pi. We know that the values are just going to be these values again. Right? Sine of 2 pi over 3, just like sine of pi over 3, is going to be root 3 over 2. And sine of 3 pi over 4 is going to be root 2 over 2. And sine of 5 pi over 6 is going to be 1 over 2. And sine of pi is going to be 0. So the values go up, and then they go back down to 0. So it's going to look just like this just reflected, so it looks like that. So you could find those same kind of three values. And then in quadrant three, sine is negative. So the next three values would be negative one half, negative root two over two, negative root three over two, negative one. But I'm just gonna worry about the fact that at three pi over two, I know I'm gonna get negative one. I'm gonna erase this because it's a little bit in the way. And then finally, at 2 pi, sine of 2 pi is going to be back to 0. So I know 
the shape of the graph is going to be nice like this. It's going to look like that. We've got a little arrows to indicate that it keeps going. So the long way to draw this is to plot all these points. The short way to draw this is to plot five points, always five points. So let's do cosine and see what it looks like. So here are the five points I actually want to plot. I want to plot the points that correspond to the quadrantal angles, meaning I'm looking at my unit circle, which I'm going to draw over here, I guess. I know I've drawn it like four times already. I'm going to ask you guys to help me out in a second here. I'm going to write my angles are zero radians, pi over two radians, pi radians, three pi over two, and two pi. That's one full revolution or one full period where I go through all of the values of the tree function you can have. All right, so cosine. Cosine is the x coordinate or the y coordinate? Well, let's see. I know that sine was the y coordinate, right? When we were doing sine, sine of zero was zero, and sine of pi over two was one, and sine of pi was zero, and sine of three pi over two was negative one. Sine's the y coordinate, cosine's gotta be the x coordinate. So we're going to find cosine of these five quadrantal angles. Zero, pi over two, pi, three pi over two, and two pi. Now, I don't really think we need to make this table or draw this picture, although I like drawing this picture. It helps me remember what's what. Um, so cosine of zero should be what? Well, there are zero radians. What's the x-coordinate? Guess there? Anybody? Anybody? Just like, oh, he's asking us a question. Someone should say something. Anybody? I know it's the last week. I know it's hard to make it to the end. But what is cosine of zero? Is it one or is it zero? Thanks, Alejandro. Appreciate it. Yep. Cosine of zero is one. And then what's cosine of pi over two? Is it zero or one? Right. And then how about cosine of pi? And how about cosine of three pi over two? And finally, you always end up where you started. Cosine of two pi should be the same as cosine of zero because they're coterminal. Or, ow, son of a gun. Ooh, ah, that kind of hurt. <laughs> uh, sorry, I kicked the, the bottom of the, of the board here. I'm not wearing shoes. Did not feel good. Okay, anyway, cosine of 2 pi is back to 1. So here's what the cosine graph looks like. So again, the way I typically draw these is I take my period length, which is 2 pi, or 1 for revolution. And I cut that into the four quadrants, or the four quarters. So I cut it in half, and I cut each of those in half. And those are going to be my four quadrantal angles. They're going to be zero, which I don't usually label because zero is always going to be where the y-axis is. And then pi over two, pi, three pi over two. And then my y-axis, I'm going to have one, so cosine of zero, right? so if x is zero, y is one. Now don't get this confused, right? When I talk about x and y, I'm talking about graphing here, but when we talk about x and y here, right? So cosine is the x coordinate, sine is the y coordinate, but now I'm graphing x is the angle and y is cosine of that angle. So if x is zero, cosine of zero is one, so the y value is one. If x is pi over two, cosine of pi over two is zero. So I get the coordinates pi over two comma zero, and then I get pi comma negative one, and then three pi over two comma zero, and then two pi comma one. And it's not like super straight, right? It's not gonna be like 
I'm going to draw it wrong for a second. It's not going to look like this. I mean, kind of going to look like that, but it's got, it's actually going to look a lot like the sine function. It's going to have the same sinusoidal shape is what we call that. Or it looks like a sine function or a cosine function. It looks more like this. So first of all, to the left, is that it's going to be like going down you know, like that. And then this should be the bottom. That's the top. So the bottom and the tops are the highest and lowest value. So like this part here, right? It shouldn't go like down further and then come back up. It's got to bottom out right at that point there. Similarly, where it's equal to one, that's the top. It's got to top out right there. So it doesn't like hit this point and keep getting bigger. It hits that point. That's the point is the top with a maximum and a smaller after that. So that's what your sine and your cosine graph will look like. So let's talk about what we can do to these, how we can shift them, or stretch them. So all of our sine and cosine graphs are gonna look like these two parent graphs just moved around. So here's kind of the bigger picture. If you've got the function or the graph of y equal to a times sine of bx plus c, or sorry, b times x minus c plus d, or cosine, y equals a times cosine of b times x minus c plus d. So here's what's going to happen. So the a, the a here, and so the a, that's going to be a vertical stretch. And so if A is larger than one, it's going to stretch it out vertically. If A is smaller than one, it's going to flatten it down, or squash it down. So this is the vertical stretch. But in, for, in particular, for tree functions, we call this the amplitude. So in this previous graph, the amplitude here is 1. There's a couple ways to think about the amplitude. You can even think about like from the middle, it's how high above and how high below you, or how far below you go. Right, we go from zero, we go one above and one below. Um, a more general way of thinking about it is it's the total length of the range. So here the range is from negative one to one, which has a length of two, it's half of that. So the amplitude is always a positive number and it's always half the length of the range. And then we have a couple other things. B here, this value of B, this modifies the period. Normally, the period is 2 pi. But really, the period is going to equal 2 pi divided by whatever that coefficient of x is. So in the previous one, our coefficient of x was just 1. So our period was 2 pi divided by 1, which is just 2 pi. And then we have a couple things we'll get to see in a second. d, that's just going to be the vertical shift, just like it normally would be. Right, when we add or subtract on the outside of the function, we shift the whole thing up or down. Right, because you're just saying, oh, well, if y is equal to something, I'm just going to make y that much bigger every time or that much smaller every time. And then finally, c is the horizontal shift. Um, let me use a different color for that. So, sorry, I, said, I, I think I said c. I'm going to draw an arrow from here. So that's the horizontal shift. Left or right. And another way to think about it, or another another thing people call it, is the phase shift. Uh, 
Um, so typically the way I think about this is by setting this equal to zero. So if we set the whole inside of the trig function equal to zero, so we set b times x minus c equal to zero, we end up getting x equal to c. It's kind of where I think it's, it's where it's little words. Oh my gosh. I think of it as where the function kind of starts. So if C is positive, it's going to start that much to the right. If C is negative, it's start that much to the left. And we'll try and get an example of that in before the end. But that's kind of the idea, the time shifting. We don't do a lot of examples with phase shifting. What is B? So B is called, it's, it modifies the period or it's the period modifier is what people call it. Um, but really, the way we think of B is that the period, the length it takes for the whole function to repeat is two pi divided by that B. No problem. Every trig function is called a periodic function. And a periodic function is a function whose, whose behavior repeats every so often. So that's why I haven't drawn all of this, right? I've only gone some of it because after you go from zero to two pi, you're just going to get the same trig values again, right? Cosine of the next coordinate is going to be zero, and cosine of the next coordinate is going to be negative one. So this does the same thing, right? It goes one, zero, negative one, zero, one, and then it goes zero, negative one, zero, one, zero, negative one, zero, one, zero, right? It just keeps doing the same thing. In fact, when I'm thinking of sine and cosine, I think about cosine starting as at the top, and then it goes high or top, top, middle, bottom, middle, top. And it just repeats middle, bottom, middle, top, middle, bottom, middle, top, middle, bottom, middle, top. And, co and sine starts, right? So here's the sine function again in green. Sine is middle, top, middle, bottom, middle, top, middle, bottom, middle, top, middle, bottom. It just keeps going. Um, in fact, you can probably see this on here. That the sine and cosine graphs are just horizontal shifts of each other. Right? If you took the cosine graph and shifted it pi over two to the right, it would be the sine graph. If you took the sine graph and shifted it pi over two to the left, it would be the cosine graph. So in fact, I might as well write it down and I've said it. It's worth knowing that sine of x plus pi over two, right, that's the graph shifted pi over two to the left. That is the cosine graph. And similarly, cosine of x minus pi over two. So if you take the cosine graph and shift it pi over two to the right, that's equal to the sine graph. I'm not going to, but you could also show that these identities are true using the angle sum formulas we talked about last week. So if you wanted to, on your own right now, you could use the angle sum identity for sine of x plus pi over two I might as well show you. So, so sorry, this is not super germane what we're doing, but I might as well just point out. You can see this graphically. You can also see this is true using an identity. So remember the identity for sine of a plus b? Sine a plus b is sine a cosine b plus cosine a sine b. So sine of x plus pi over 2 is equal to sine of x times cosine of pi over 2 plus cosine of x times sine of pi over 2. Cosine of pi over 2, cosine of pi over 2 is 0. Sine of pi over 2, sine of pi over 2 is 1. So this is equal to sine times 0, which is 0, plus cosine times 1, which is cosine. Oh yeah, it totally works. You don't have to do that. I just thought that it was neat to show you. So you can see these things are true anyway. That's not really the point today, but okay. So what we want to do now is just graph some other transform sine and cosine graphs. So let's look at some examples. So I would like us to graph y equal to sine, 3 sine of x. So the only thing that's going to change from the regular sine function is that the amplitude is going to be larger. Here, the amplitude is going to be 3. 
So instead of going up as high as one and down as low as negative one, it's going to go up as high as three and down as low as negative three. So typically when I'm graphing the trig function, I like to write down what the amplitude and the period are. The period here is still two pi, but it hasn't changed at all. There's nothing to modify it. Um, you can also write down the vertical shift if you want to. In this case, the vertical shift, there isn't any, right? There's nothing we're adding or subtracting out here. Usually if there isn't something, we don't write that there, right? You just usually kind of omit it instead of saying. So what modifies the period is the coefficient of x. In this case, the coefficient of x is one. So really, there's a one times x there, and the period is really two pi divided by one which doesn't change it. So that's why we don't really say that. But you put your book, but it is two pi. So then we're gonna take our two pi, right, there's our period from zero to two pi, and we're gonna cut it into four equal lengths, which happen to be the quadrantal angles. So sine, so in fact, here's the normal sine function that we just graphed a minute ago. So here is sine in red. Right, exactly, Alejandro. That's exactly why it's two pi. Because once you go around a full revolution, you've gone through all the values the trade function you can have, and then they just start repeating themselves. So here's the sine function, sine of x in red. And all we're doing to this sine function is we're taking every input and multiplying the output by three. Right? If I plug in pi over two, well sine of pi over two is one, 3 times sine of pi over 2 is going to be 3 times 1, which will be 3. So I end up getting, instead of pi over 2 comma 1, I get pi over 2 comma 3. And instead of 0, 0, I get 0, 0. And pi 0, right? Because you multiply 0 by 3, you still get 0. And instead of getting 3 pi over 2 negative 1, I get 3 pi over 2 negative 3. And I get 2 pi 0. I've taken my sine graph and I've stretched it out. Sorry, it's hard to kind of graph these things. I can't see it looking at it from the side. So there's our actual three times sine of x graph. I've stretched it vertically away from the x-axis. How many of those values? So I'm taking my sine values. So I am using the fact that we graphed the sine function, which has the values 0, 1, 0, negative 1, 0 and multiplying all of them by three. We could make a table. We could say here's our angles, here's sine of those angles, and here's three times sine of those angles. And we could use the unit circle if we wanted to, right? With those four points, the points being one, zero, zero, one, negative one, zero, zero, negative one. The angles being 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi. Sine is the y coordinate, so sine of 0 is, let me write my angles first. But again, right, to, to go back to the 2 pi thing for a second, right, after you go 1, 4 evolution, the sine values or whatever the trig function values are just the same. So sine of 0 is 0. And sine of pi over 2 is 1. And sine of 3 pi over 2 is 0. Sorry, sine of pi is 0. Sine of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1. And sine of 2 pi is back to 0. And then to graph 3 sine of x, I'm just taking all those values and multiplying them by 3. So I'm getting 3 times 0, 3 times 1, 3 times 0, 3 times negative 1, 3 times 0. That's how I'm getting these points here. Right? This is the point pi over 2 comma 3. This is the point 3 pi over 2 comma negative 3. 
This is the point zero zero pi zero and two pi zero. And if we wanted to, we could graph a whole another period. So you are only going to be asked typically to graph one period of a function, but you could graph many. So for example, what if I wanted to graph y equal to four, sorry, not four, to cosine of four x. So we have a vertical shift. So we're going to shift it up by one. So let me actually graph just cosine up by one. So eh, no, maybe not actually. Um, and then we know that the period here, normally the period would be two pi. And now the period's going to be two pi divided by that four. which is equal to pi over two. So we're gonna get one full period of the cosine function but it's gonna be smushed into much less space. Um, and then I should also just mention that the amplitude is still one right there. We didn't change the amplitude. So let me talk about how we're modifying this. Let me take my So here's my regular period for a regular cosine function, which I know how we're graphing. I'm going to start with that. And my amplitude is one. All right, so here, if I break this into four equal sections, so there's pi, there's pi over two, and there's three pi over three. So here in red is just regular good old cosine. Starts at one, then is equal to zero, then is negative one, then is zero, then is back to one. So there's cosine. And now I want to scrunch it that has less period, right? This is the period of two pi. So again, when I say the period, I mean how long it takes for the function to go through one full cycle or one full period of the thing. So now I need to get all of this, but scrunched into one fourth the space. So that's going to mean from here to here, I'm going to get one full period. There's my pi over two. So I'm going to break from zero to pi over two up into four equal sub sections or four equal quarters. So I'm going to cut it in half and I'm going to cut each of those in half again. And I know that cosine starts at the top and then at the next important point is in the middle and then the next important point is the bottom and then back to the middle and then back to the top. So here is what one period of cosine of 4x would look like. I'll draw this back. So we could draw multiple periods, right? Here's another period. Right, just is the same thing. Every period is the same thing. I know this one looks a little lower because my drawing is not perfect. In fact, the interesting kind of thing about that number four there is that number also tells you how many full periods you would get from zero to two pi. Now I could draw two more full periods. Not very well. Sorry, I know my, my periods got kind of wonky looking. But there's one, two, three, four full periods or one period in one fourth the length. And we're not quite done, right? So there's our one period, but now we have to shift it up by one. So we're gonna move the whole graph up one. 
So instead of starting at one and then going down to the middle at zero and the bottom at negative one, I'm going to start up here at two. I'm going to end at two. In the middle, I'm going to, so, right, I'm going to go two and then a quarter of the way through, I'm going to be down at one. And then another quarter of the way, I'm going to be down at the bottom, which is now zero. And then back in the middle of one and back. So it seems like a lot of work, right? To kind of do this whole thing. So I'm trying to kind of show you where the graph is coming from. Let me show you the work I would actually do. So I was actually just trying to graph a period of cosine of 4x plus 1. I would just be trying to graph that part there. And I said, OK, well, I know it's going to scrunch down to a period that's just pi over 2. And it's also going to shift up by one. So I usually think of if it's not vertically shifted, the x-axis, which is the line y equals zero, is the middle line. Your, the graph is going to be as much above it as it is below it. If you shift it up by one, your new middle line is going to be shifted up by one. So I'm going to say there's one, there's two, and I'm going to draw a dashed horizontal line. It's not an asymptote. It's just a new middle line. And I know that that's going to be kind of the middle. I know that the cosine function starts not in the middle, but above. So I'm going to start up here. And then break that into four quarters. Start at the top, then the middle, then the bottom, then back to the middle, then back to the top. There's my cosine of, well, there's my cosine of 4x plus 1. One period's worth anyway. Okay. Let me compare for you just so you guys can see it. If on the other hand I was going to be graphing sine of 4x plus 1, well, I would do the same work, right? I would. Period would still be pi over 2, because again, it's 2 pi divided by 4. And then I take my period that was so great. So here's my pi over 2, which is my period. And I break that pi over 2 up into four equal quadrants. Cut it in half, and cut each of those in half again. Here's my new middle line, y equal to 1. And I know for sine, the sine doesn't start at the top and then go down and then down and then up and up. Sine starts in the middle, and then in the next quadrant goes up to the top, and then back to the middle, and then to the bottom, and then back to the middle. So there's one period of sine of 4x plus 1. OK, let's do some more. Let's look at the next one, which is 3 cosine of 1 half x minus 1. I don't know about, yeah, sure, minus 1. That's fine. Yeah. So typically, although I didn't for the last problem, I usually like to label the four important, or I should say the five important points. So for this one, right, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 0, pi over 8, 2 pi over 8, 3 pi over 8, 4 pi over 8, which is pi over 2. I'll find more about that in this next problem. So I want to find, I want to graph y equal to 3 sine of 1 half x minus 1. We've got a lot of things going on here. We've got an amplitude. It's three. We've got a vertical shift, which is negative one or down one. And we've got a period that is two pi divided by the coefficient of x, which is one half. Two pi divided by one half is equal to two pi times two, which is equal to four pi. So one whole period is four pi.
And we know we always want to take whatever our whole period is and cut it up into four equal quadrants. Now in this case, it's really easy because four pi divided by four is just pi. So these quadrants are occurring at pi, two pi, three pi, and four pi. And it really is correct to say four quadrants here because if x goes from zero to four pi, one half x goes from zero to two pi. So you get one four evolution. That's why we're really doing this thing where we say the period is two pi divided by that because like in this previous example, <clears throat> the period is really pi over two because if x goes from zero to pi over two, then the angle 4x, well, if I multiply everything by 4, 4 times 0 is 0, and 4 times pi over 2 is 2 pi. So that's how this part's really working. The reason our period is so much smaller here is because the only well, x only has to go from 0 to pi over 2 for 4 times x to go from 0 to 2 pi, which is 1 4 evolution. In a similar way here, since we have 1 half x, well, now x has to go all the way from 0 to 4 pi, so that one half of x goes from zero to two pi, we get one full revolution. So this is one full period or one full revolution if we have one half of x. Okay, so then we're going to have a vertical shift of negative one, which means we're gonna go down one. And I'm gonna draw that as my new middle line. Whoops, we'll try and keep that middle line fairly horizontal. And here's where we have to be a little bit extra careful. My amplitude is three, which means we're going to go three above and three below. So we're going to go one, two, three above. Negative one plus three is two. And one, two, three below. Negative one minus three is negative four. And the sign, does it start at the top, the middle, or the bottom? Sign starts in the middle. I'm going to start in the middle. And then my next important value would be at the top. And this is really, really important. And my next important value, I'm back to the middle. Right? I'm not right there on the x-axis. I'm down here on my middle line. And then for the next important value, I'm down to the bottom. And for my last important value, I'm back to the middle. But it's really easy to want to put those points on the x-axis. Here's what my graph looks like. Well, kind of. And this is a graph where I don't care about what the x-intercepts are. This point here and this point here are not points you have to worry about. I only really, really care about these five points. And I do want these four, five technically, right? Because the origin, or the x equals zero. I do want these five x values labeled in some way so that we're like, oh yeah, we have some x values here. Um, and again, these x values should always represent your period broken up into four equal quarters. Let's graph one or two more. I mean, I'd love to graph more than that, but we don't have time for one or two more. Let's do that one, sure. So let's try graphing y equal to negative four times cosine of two of x. So I'm gonna throw in a plus one. Why not? Well, I can make it more difficult, but that's okay. Um, so how do they get which values? The zero pi, two pi, three pi, and four pi? Or the, the values, the y values? So really what I'm doing is I'm using the unit circle. And I'm using, so I'm using the fact that 
I know that the sine function, the sine function does this. Sine goes zero, one, zero, negative one, or middle, top, middle, bottom. So the way I'm thinking of this is I shifted down once, so my new middle is negative one, and I stretched by a factor of three. So instead of my, you know, instead of my top being one, my middle being zero, my middle is now negative one, and my top is three above it, my bottom is three below it. Let me show you another example that I think will probably help. So for this example here, mm, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to have a vertical shift of up one. I'm going to have a amplitude of four. So amplitude is always a positive number, even though it's negative right there. The negative here, is going to give me a vertical flip. And then the period is going to be 2 pi divided by 2. 2 pi divided by the coefficient of x, which is 2. And then I'm going to break that period up into four equal sections. cut it in half and then cut each of those in half. Another way you can do this is you actually divide this by four. So one fourth the period is one fourth of pi. Or if you like, it's pi over four. So if this is a whole period length, each of these lengths is one fourth of that period. So from zero to here should be one fourth of pi. From here to here should be one fourth of pi. So pi over four plus another pi over four is two pi over four. Two pi over four plus another pi over four is three pi over four. And three pi over four plus another pi over four is four pi over four, which is pi. So now here's how I'm using the y values. I'm using my vertical shift and say, okay, my vertical shift is up one. So here's my new middle, y equals one. And then I'm gonna go four above. One to five. Sorry, I know it's kind of a little messy there. Apologies. I'm gonna go four below. One, two, three, four. Or even one minus four is negative three. One plus four is five. So I know that these three numbers represent my top, my middle, and my bottom. And then the cosine function at the quadrants will cosine typically starts at the top at one, and then goes to the middle at zero, then to the bottom at negative one, then back to the middle, then back to the top. So cosine goes top, middle, bottom, middle, top. So normally, I'm gonna graph this one first. This would be my cosine function. It would be top, middle at the next point, bottom at the next point, middle at the next point, top at the next point. I'm going to graph this even though I know it's not right. So this graph here that I've done dashed, this graph here would be positive for cosine of 2x plus 1. Right? I took my cosine graph and I just graphed it. And now, I should have actually done a flip before I shifted it up one. So it should actually start at the bottom, which is negative three. And then the middle, and then the top, and then the middle, and then the bottom. So it should look like this. I should just graph it. I don't need to graph the dash. Yeah, it can be challenging sometimes to make these look exactly right. So there's your four, negative four cosine of two x plus one. And really, to be honest, I kind of really thought of it as doing 
the flip first and then shifting it up one, right? Because normally it would be all down and it goes highest four and close to negative four, and then I shift it all up. Um, we could probably squeeze in one more if we're fast. Let's do one more. So again, I'm really kind of a big fan of this idea that for the cosine function, cosine is always top, middle, bottom, middle, top. Those are the five points of the cosine function. And then if you have a vertical flip, it flips, right? So this one would have been top, middle, bottom, middle, top, but it flipped over. So it was bottom, middle, top, middle, bottom. Whereas the sine function is middle, top, middle, bottom, middle. Basically, you're always moving. If you're in the middle, then you go up to the top or bottom, depending. Right? You basically middle, then top, the middle, then you can't go back to the top, so you're to the bottom. And then to the middle, and you can't go back to the bottom, so to the top. So it's always middle, then a place you haven't been. Middle, then a place you haven't been. Middle, top, middle, bottom. Middle, top, middle, bottom. Middle, top, middle. Middle, middle, top, middle, bottom. Middle, top, middle, bottom. Middle, top, middle, bottom. Middle, top. Right. It's always the same kind of pattern. Um, so we have one minute. So what I wanted to graph was this last one, which is y equal to 2 sine of 2 thirds x plus three. And so the way we would do this, I'm going to do this one very quickly. I'm going to shift up three. So my new middle line is y equal to three. The amplitude is two, so we're going to go two above and two below that middle line. So we're going to go as high as five. And as low as one. So those are the only three y values we care about. The middle value, which is how much vertical shift you've got, could be zero. And then how far above and how far below that, which is just your middle value plus your amplitude and your middle value minus your amplitude. And then we care about the period. The period here is two pi divided by two thirds. Flip the multiplier. It's 2 pi times 3 halves, the 2's cancel, and you get 3 pi. So I'm going to take my 3 pi period, which is probably not to scale, and I'm going to cut it in half, cut each of those in half again. Now I do think it's important to label those x values, even though they're not x-intercepts, I just want to know what those values are. So the way I do that, well, I just cut my period into how many sections? How many? Looks like four, four quarters. So I'm breaking this period up into four quarters. One fourth of my period is one fourth of three pi, which is three pi over four. So from zero to the end of the first quarter it is three pi over four. And then I add another three pi over four to get six pi over four. And I add another three pi over four to get nine pi over four. And I add another 3 pi over 4 to get 12 pi over 4, which is 3 pi. All right. Sine is middle, top, middle, bottom, middle. So middle, next value is at the top. Next important value is at the middle. Next important value is at the bottom. Next important value is back to the middle. So it looks like this. Oof. Hard to graph on the side. Let me try and graph this a little better. It looks like this. 